Hi, everybody. Welcome to my presentation at Kubicon Cloud Native Com North America 2020 Virtual. The topic here today is API priority and fairness, Kubi API server flow control protection. Before we are getting started, I need to say that because this presentation is held online virtually, so I enrich the contents of this PowerPoint a bit so that you can check out the details after it's finished. And the topic is about a new feature gate introduced into Kubernetes 118 release named API Priority and Fairness. And earlier this year in April, there's a official blog on the Kubernetes site named API Priority and Fairness Alpha, which basically tells you what's happening um, in the alpha releases. And if you don't got any backgrounds or any other information about this feature, I highly recommend you to read this blog. It's only gonna take you like five minutes so for, for folks who are interested in the design or implementation details, um, there is also a cap um, under the Kubernetes CIP machinery folder. Um, it's gonna take you um, have a deeper um, insight of this feature um, and the um, things you might be interested um, when, in terms of further customizing for your cluster. Um, then I'm going to have a brief introduction about myself. I'm main, I'm working at um, Ant Group as a software engineer. And I've been working at Sig API Machinery for about three years. Uh, and I'm also a Kubernetes Sig API Machinery subproject owners uh, covering several subprojects. My GitHub alias is UE994482. Um, the same name is also my um, Gmail account. If you got any questions after this presentation, please feel free to contact me by either the email or the names on the Kubernetes Slack channels. So um, the, the team, the squad building this feature covers many different developers from different countries and different um, companies and my uh, so there's Mike from IBM, Daniel from Google, David from Red Hat, and there are also other contributors so far. Uh, Aaron, Jonathan, Bruce, Yu, Meng Yi. Thank you for all your contributions so far. Then let's take a look at the agenda of our presentation today. Um, we're gonna show you the back background and motivation of this feature. Then there's gonna be a um, visit retrospection of system design. And, and next, I will also show you the alpha, alpha stage implementation, uh, which basically covers the API models and, uh, a, and, and the systems, the implementation sources. And then we move on to the demo, in which I will show you how to customize flow control settings for your own clusters. Notably, we are using a KNZ cluster, uh, which is just created by me um, in the virtual, um, in, um, not, not in the virtual box, it's um, just a new brand new cluster so that you can easily uh, reproduce that, you can easily rerun that in your local environment. And at last, I will show you there's a, a few planned enhancements for the beta stage. Okay, let's move on to the first part, the background and motivation. Basically, there are two higher goals of our feature. The first one is the self-protection, um, which uh, basically covers two points. The first is prioritize cluster critical requests for self-maintenance. And the second one is prevent spammy clients or buggy controllers from stunning the whole cluster. Um, the, the, the first one is basically saying that we are going to sort all the client requests into different priorities. And the second one is saying that we are not, um, we are not allowing any client requests to spoil all the clusters. There will be a vanilla isolation between clients. Um, as for protection, we are actually protecting QBAP servers from incoming client requests. So, uh, we should start by understanding there are different kinds of client requests being served by the typical Kubernetes servers. 
their API server loopbacks, delegate a request from a aggregated API server or a machine webhooks. There are also controller requests and there are daemon requests. Um, as for Kube API server loopbacks, so the Kube API server instance will be requesting against itself even if there are no client requests at all, such as um, there's a informal factory instance singleton in each of the Kube API server process. Uh, basically, the Kube API server need to know the actual status of each clusters by accessing the um, object cache provided by the Informa factory. All of these informers will keep raising a list and watch requests against the Kube API server until it's down. And there are also several embedded controllers inside the Kube API server. Uh, for example, there are cluster CA rotators and there are CRD related controllers um, and there are also API server aggregation related controllers. All of these controllers should be regarded as first class citizens in the Kubernetes world because they are strongly connected with the healthy status of whole cluster. If you are failing the um, cluster loopbacks, then there's going to be uh, bigger problems in your clusters. Um, the your cluster is very, very likely to be crushed down. And as for the delegated request from aggregated API server and emission webhooks, um, so basically the Kube API server provided us some extensibilities to allow us to add a new resource to the cluster and also intercept some of the resources. These extensions will be invoked during the time when the Kube API server serving an incoming request. For example, if you add a emission webhooks on the pod resource, then when you are start starting a request against a Kube API server on pod resource, then the Kube API server will raise another request against the emission webhooks. Um, the secondary request um, should, be, should have a higher priority than the original request. Otherwise, there's gonna be a deadlock in the request chain, which is uh, going to cause some problems in the clusters. And there are also controller problems. Uh, we had a situation where a bug in the deployment controller caused it to run a Mac under certain, certain circumstances, issuing requests in a tight loop. So we'd like these um, controller bugs not to take the whole system down. Um, these um, controllers can also be some custom root, uh, controllers, which is developed by leveraging some um, scaffolding toolings, for example, group builders, um, playing with the custom resource definitions. And if, if these buggy controllers can have these ill behaviors, um, it's going to be a harm to the group API server as well. Um, so the, um, there can be controller singletons and there can be also daemons. It can be a uh, kubelet, kubproxy or other per node controllers. Um, if there are bugs in these per node controllers, the impact, the influences on the system is going to be multiplied from the uh, controller singleton, so we definitely want to avoid them. Um, on the other hand, these uh, the, the issues from uh, demons doesn't necessarily connect it with a bug. Uh, it can be the cluster reaching its scalability limit. For example, if you have too many nodes in the cluster, then your cluster uh, will be reaching the scalability ceilings. Um, but we don't we don't know the ceilings until we actually reach it. So um, but at, at, least, at least we don't want the new, newly added node to be um, taking the whole system down. Um, there, there should be a way to um, make the cluster keep running, even if there's too many demons added to the cluster. There's another uh, higher purpose multi-tenancy, which um, demands us to provide guarantee the capacity for controllers that are considered less important. And the tenants in the same priority band sharing the cluster should get an equal share of the service. Um, so I believe that Kubernetes is designed to be shared by multiple tenants. 
there are many different kinds of um, tenants definitions so far. Uh, a tenant can be a namespace, can be a user, can be a, uh, several users sharing a prefix or uh, several users having the same host uh, in, in the same group. Uh, and don't forget that there's another subproject under Kubernetes 6 named multi-tenancy, which has a brand new definition of tenants, which is basically a group of uh, namespaces. Um, there are also non-goals of our feature background. Um, there will be no coordination between the API server, nor is a um, external load balancer. And we will also not attempt auto-tuning the capacity. We will not attempt to reproduce the functionality of the existing event we're limiting emission plugin. Uh, the emission plugin is basically uh, intercepting the request against uh, event resource by using a uh, token bucket filter. So this one is basically saying that we are not generalizing the token bucket filters to all the resources or something like that. Let's move on to the second part, the system design retrospection. So uh, we need to know their um, basics about flow control algorithms. Um, there are basically two kinds of flow control algorithms. The first one is at the source or the client side. And the second one is at the gateway or server side, we say. Um, the client side we're limiting is already supported because uh, could be observable about the, the, the Kubernetes client goal provides a token bucket relimiter for muzzling the client. And there was even a dedicated emission controllers for limiting the relimiting the events. But there are still a few known defects. The first one is that user can opt out from the uh, relimiting by granting the token buckets uh, minus or infinite capacity. Uh, and also it's um, sometimes it's tough to control the granularity if there are multiple controller, multiple clients uh, in, built in the, in the same components, in the same code processes. For example, we want a higher, um, a, a, loose, a loose control of relimiting for one controller and, uh, and tighter for another, then it's gonna be uh, a bit tough to configure. Um, then let's take a look at the existing limiters in the Kubernetes cool servers. Um, there are two dimensions to, to do the limit. The first one is by configuring max mutating requests in flight, max requests in flight flex, which allows you to uh, set the limits of request concurrent request count on either uh, mutating requests or non mutating requests. And uh, you can also apply a timeout for non wrong running requests, which is basically the non watch request. Um, then let's move on, uh, learn from the Linux QDIS um, systems, uh, because it's going to be really helpful for us to understand how the, um, um, the Linux networking system, relimiting systems, which is already proven to be successful. Um, there are basically two kinds of QDISC in Linux networking. The first one is classless and classful. Um, there, are, there are a few um, outstanding algorithms from Robin, Codel, TBF uh, under the classless QDISC. And actually there, there's a um, longer list of it, but we're not showing every algorithm, just uh, a few uh, outstanding algorithms. Um, anyway, the, in the class list QDISC, every request will be regarded equally. Um, but in the Kubernetes API server, um, there's already a system of authentication, authorization. So there is a, already a abstract of user identities. Um, so we need the class for QDISC in the, building the Kubernetes server. Um, there, uh, there's um, a few um, class for QDIS um, algorithms built in, in the Linux networking systems. Um, there's deficit round robin and hierarchical token buckets. Um, uh, to mention, one thing to mention is that uh, we are learning a lot from the both algorithms. Uh, I remember we spent like several meetings discussing um, the differences from um, uh, 
that deficit from Robin uh, and there's a few other algorithms, especially the hierarchical token buckets. It's a bit complicated, but um, it's, it's proven to be working well for most of the use cases. So um, here's a obstruction of a flow control system, classical flow control system we want to build in the group Apple server. There are basically going to be three abstract components. The first one is the rule-based classifier, then a queue assigner, then a queue scheduler. The three components is basically working like a um, lambda functions, classify a maps request to a, a request class, a queue assigner puts a request in a request class into, into certain queues, then the queue scheduler applies delays to the queues uh, where the um, where the request is um, waiting. Um, then let's move on to the to what we can do in the classifier. Um, um, we extend the abstraction of class from Linux TC systems to priority levels in the Google Apple server. In the new flow control system, a priority level is uh, a priority level band that requests in higher priorities should have a a higher should be executed in prior to lower priorities. And a priority level is a request class in which all of these matching requests will be handled equally. And a priority level is also a, prior, uh, a request class where we apply the same rejection strategy. Um, so to classify the request into proper priority levels, the information we can get from the group API server request context is um, for the first one is client identity. Uh, for now, there are two kinds of useful identities. The first one is the user or username, then the user groups, like a list of tags on the users. Then there are uh, requesting targets, um, um, which basically covers the requesting uh, namespaces and other request metadata, for example, the verbs, then the target resource types, etc. Um, so, so we know that what we are doing in the queue assigner is basically uh, mapping a uh, request to a priority level using the identity of this. Then let's move on to the queue assigner. Um, so each priority level contains a group of request queues for scheduling. Uh, the, prob the question is how to map a request to one of the queues. Um, one way, uh, one easiest way or intuitive way is to map one queue per user. Um, if you have um, 10 users, then you're gonna have 10 queues in the, for one priority levels. But there are gonna be problems if you have tens of thousands of users. There, if you have tens of thousands of queues in your product level, then there's going to be a uh, significant memory cost. Um, to avoid that, we use another technique named the shuffle shading. Um, the shuffle shading helps us to bound the uh, memories into, um, into a fixed number, a constant number. Uh, in, the, in this picture, I, uh, I showed you uh, a shuffle shading of hand size Q and um, basically the, the users from user one, for example, is sharded uh, in a round robin manner to both Q1 and Q2. So that's the other users. Um, the, this picture also showed you that when the, um, there's some problem with the uh, user, user one, then um, the impacts will be spread to Q1 and Q2. Uh, so uh, the user three, number three will not be affected at all, and, but user two and user four will be partially impacted. Um, the higher, a higher number of uh, hand size you have, the, um, in, the impact will be shouted lesser. Mm. And as for the queue scheduler, um, we, we have, we are really using a algorithm named fair queuing, which is basically uh, aiming at achieving the following goals of an S4 scheduling request from queues. Uh, the first one is the even distribution of 
um, service capacity, and uh, the other is the maximum fairness. Um, there are a few, I got a few uh, details about the fair queuing, but we are not expanding them today because, of, because the time is limited. Um, so uh, if you got interested in the fair queuing algorithms, you can uh, revisit these slides afterwards. Um, so we had a variant of fair queuing for server request to solve these um, limitations for Google Data Server. The first one is this patching request to be served uh, rather than packets to be transmitted. Second one is multiple requests can be served at once. The third limitation is the actual service time is not known until a request is done being served. So, um, so uh, we made a few uh, mutations variants to the fair queuing algorithm so that it can adapt to the Google Data Server. Um, I'm still not going to expand it to save our time. So this is um, the our flow control system going to be look at. Uh, the, there's a uh, priority level classifier and uh, shuffle sharding and the fair queuing. Then let's take a look at the alpha level uh, API definition models. Uh, you can acquire the new feature by enabling the feature gates and add a new flags to the uh, Kube API server's starting flags. Um, this is the exam flow schema. Uh, where you can see we, we uh, it matches uh, uh, then, then a user in the group system masters uh, assessing everything in the cluster, then it will be uh, matching the exam flow schema. There is also a catch all flow schema. One thing different is that it has a distinguisher method. If you got interested in distinguisher method, then uh, you can you can take a take a look at the caps to to know how what what what, what this is doing. Uh, and uh, in the priority level configurations, uh, you you have places to configure the uh, hand sizes for uh, shuffle sharding, which we just talked about. And then I'm gonna have a demo of customizing this. Um, so I'm using a cluster. So um, you can you can uh, create a new KMD cluster using these settings. And here we got the um, private level named workflow medium. We are creating this to the cluster. And we create a new uh, flow schema, um, which matches uh, the, the users from demo user. Um, create this to the uh, cluster. Um, then we can take a look at this Grafana dashboard. Uh, in this panel, uh, it shows you the capacity limit of this priority level and the QPS of each priority level, how the requests of each priority level are queued, I've been waiting, and the actual executing time costs of each priority level. All, all of these um, times are calculated um, by uh, using P, P50, P90, P99. Um, um, in this example, the um, uh, medium, the workload medium priority level configurations only has a concurrency shares of one. Uh, now we give it a higher concurrency share. For example, we make this 50. Then we apply, then we apply this to the um, cluster. Um, um, 
then you can see the um, concurrency shares are recalculated. Um, the uh, the medium the medium workload priority level configuration now gets a uh, capacity limit of of one hundred and twenty. Um, yeah, and um, because the time is limited, so I, I can show you uh, how everything works. Um, uh, if you if you got questions, I can uh, give you a detailed um, demo after or offline. Mm, let's let's give on. Um, move on to the presentation. Uh, then it's the planned enhancements for beta stage. Um, there are a few, there are blocking items and non-blocking items planned for beta stage. Um, as for blocking items, um, um, it's um, improving the observability and robustness. Um, we added a debug. Uh, we are adding a debug endpoints to the API server, which is already done. I believe it's already published in Kubernetes 1.19 release. And um, there's also a few um, new metrics added to the system, which is definitely helpful. Um, but I'm, I'm not showing them to you in this presentation because it's uh, basically used for debugging. And if you if got interested, I can answer that in the Q&A section. Uh, and um, the second one is providing approaches to opt out client side real limiting. Uh, I'm not sure if it's um, done so far, but um, the ultimate goal is to remove the client side we're limiting um, to move them all, all, all to the server side um, or at the gateway. And then the third one is we are doing necessary E2E tests. Um, this is uh, our current progress. We are adding E2E tests, um, hopefully before one twenty release. And as for non-blocking items, um, here's a few um, optional goals. The first one is a supports concurrency limits on long, long running requests. And the second one is allow constant concur concurrency and um, related shares in priority level API model. Uh, for now, it's only a proportion of API shares, uh, API concurrency shares. Um, we hope to um, allow users to configure a fixed uh, concurrency or preserved concurrency for a priority level. Um, the third one is automatic, automatically manages versions of mandatory and suggested configurations. Um, this one is basically saying that uh, we are pro providing a better user experience um, for users to uh, roll out to update, upgrade the um, system presets, flow control settings, um, flexibly. Uh, and um, the first one is discriminate paginated list request. This is um, what we are uh, trying to achieve before 120 release because um, unpaginated list requests is um, very likely to harm the cluster and, and it's almost happening every day <laughs> in our production classes. So uh, we hope to prevent this from happening. Um, so this is what we are going to do uh, non-blocking items for beta stage. Uh, for more uh, graduating criteria for beta stage, you can also uh, read them from the CAC. And thank you for um, visiting my presentation. Then let's move on to the Q&A session. Thank you.